right, so we can get started. Welcome everyone to Friday Night AI. We are very happy to virtually have you join us tonight. I'm Radha Mihalcha, I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Michigan. I'm also the director of the Artificial Intelligence Lab. And about two years ago, we started the Friday Night AI series in an attempt to engage more closely with the community on topics that are of interest to all of us. So tonight, I'm very pleased to have you all join us for a discussion on how artificial intelligence interacts with language. Of course, we use language uh, for pretty much everything. I obviously use language now. Uh, we use language to talk to one another, to tell stories, to express feelings of happiness or frustration, um, to teach or give advice, um, and for so many other situations. Uh, while language some consider to be uniquely human, recent decades have witnessed significant advances in AI systems that process, classify, or even generate language. And there are many applications that we sometimes use daily. Um, for instance, Siri or Alexa are examples of such language applications that are powered by AI, Google search, Zoom transcription, and so much more. So tonight's discussion is around computational models of language, how they work, how they attempt to understand, quote-unquote understand, or create, again, quote-unquote language, um, how they are used in applications, and some are, what are some major limitations they have. I'm very happy to be joined tonight by two experts in this space, uh, Professor Stephen Abney, who is um, an Associate Professor of Linguistics and Affiliate of Computer Science and Engineering and Michigan Institute for Data Science. Um, he's been at U of M since 2002. Uh, before that, he was a member of the AI department at AT&T and Bell Communications Research and an Assistant Professor at the University of Tübingen in Germany which incidentally, some of you may know, this is a sister city of Ann Arbor. I actually didn't know before then, uh, but I like these sister cities. I think it's a cool thing. Um, we are also joined by Dr. Ian Stewart. Um, he is a postdoctoral researcher at U of M. He works in the Michigan Institute for Data Science and also the Computer Science and Engineering Department. He earned a PhD in human-centered computing in 2020 from the Georgia Institute of Technology. And he develops natural language processing methods for personalized text generation, social bias detection, and other social science applications. So before we get started, um, I just wanted to share a few logistics. Um, we will be together for about an hour. For the first 30 minutes, uh, Professor Abney and Dr. Stewart will address various aspects regarding the use of computational models of language. And then for the second half, uh, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. You can do that using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen, if you join through the webinar, um, or on YouTube. Um, and those questions will be shared with us here. So with that, we can get started. Tonight's Friday Night AI is a collaboration between Michigan AI, Midas, and the Ann Arbor Public Library. Uh, which is broadcasting the event live on YouTube as we speak. So let me get started with the first question for our panelists. Uh, for the audience to get to know you better, um, can you share what was your career path? How did you get interested in AI and language? And what keeps you excited about this area? Steve, did you want to start? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um... Uh, I think you've listed the places where I've been in my career. Um, my um, interest started out with, uh, I studied linguistics and um, actually linguistics and classics, so Greek and Latin, um, and taught myself computation and uh, worked in AI departments after that. So um, sort of on the job training as much as anything. Um, the things that I'm really interested in or what, what got me motivated in the first place from the, from the very beginning was wanting to understand thought, that thought, how it is that we're able to think is a 
um, a mystery that always motivated me. And, and the other half of it, the mysteries that particularly grabbed me when I was young was, were um, languages and particularly ancient languages, which is why I ended up in Greek and Latin. Um, I was a big Tolkien fan, for example, and that's that's sort of how I ended up in linguistics as well as is, is, um, is starting out uh, interested in creating languages, which um, I guess to sort of segue into what keeps me motivated, what I'm particularly interested in. Um, I mean, part of it is just how do we, how how does language work? How it's we have a computational system as people for processing language, for for taking meanings and turning them into sentences or taking sentences and turning them back into meanings. And how is it that we're able to do that? Um, and sort of understanding that's always been something that motivated me. Um, and it's there, there really is a very tight knit relationship between thought and, and language. Um, and D Descartes posed the question back in the 1600s about what, what sets people apart from automatas um, and decided that it was language, which you know, is like the Turing test. That language is what makes us human. Language, language is what um, uh, is particularly, in, or, or in many ways central in, in, in AI and in, in understanding thought. Um, and then it's and the, the other half of that is then looking at lots of different languages and understanding what the range of things are that go on in languages and, and particularly languages that are very different from English. Um, so uh, not only ancient language languages, but one of the big issues right now in linguistics is language endangerment. Languages are going away at a very rapid pace. Um, and the estimates are that 90% uh, that of the world's languages will either be dead or moribund by the end of the century, which is really dire. Um, and so tackling the question of what is language in general, how do we get all of these languages under one roof or treat them as one giant data set? That's that's a really daunting question, and it, and it takes combining AI, it takes combining computational techniques with traditional language documentation, and that's that's an area that I'm very that I'm very interested in. Well, thanks, Steve, and I think I'm also myself fascinated by a connection between thought and language. And since you also mentioned multiple languages, a question which one could think of is whether people who speak different languages would then eventually think differently, uh, which is a big area, and I know it's a debated area, but very, very interesting. So, Ian, would you want to add about your career path and what keeps you excited in yeah. body space? Yeah, for sure. It's um, definitely not as um, eloquent as what Steve just said, but um, I've always been interested in um, sort of the intersection of language and society. Um, so that could include questions like, how do people pick up new slang words? Um, why do people in parts of the US speak differently from each other? Um, how do we signal that we're trying to be polite to somebody or that we're trying to you know, enact some kind of relationship with somebody? Um, to me, that's always fascinated me. So um, I, um, yeah, I ended up uh, going to college for both linguistics as well as computer science. I'm always interested in sort of quantitative aspects, approaches to language, as well as like the theory. Um, I learned in college that you can combine them. You can do something called NLP, natural language processing, where you try to get computers to understand language. Um, and I was really interested in, you know, trying to figure out if there are ways that computers can understand just the, you know, um, sort of literal meaning of, you know, what words mean, but also the social meaning of what those words mean. Um, so that led me to do a PhD in um, sort of the social side of natural language processing. So ended up studying questions like, um, can we computationally, you know, predict whether certain words, like certain slang words, will get adopted or not? Um, can we predict um, sort of in what social situations people will switch between languages? Um, 
uh, can we predict, um, you know, through sort of subtle language choices over time, how people are reacting to sort of complicated real life events. Um, and um, yeah, I primarily did lots of this work using social media data as a sort of um, reflection of like society. Um, so um, yeah, interested in, you know, developing sort of natural language tools to help understand society kind of at large scale. Um, and recently been working more on the side of, um, instead of trying to understand society, can we sort of take existing social theories about how language works and sort of build those into our, you know, complicated uh, natural language like computer models um, so that we can end up with um, sort of more socially appropriate systems. Um, this could include things like, um, uh, you know, if you have, um, if you're, you know, writing a letter and you're writing to a particular audience, um, you know, could there be some, you know, uh, Grammarly type system that gives you feedback to help you communicate better with that particular audience? Um, that's sort of one example of, you know, a socially aware system. Um, another example is, um, you know, if uh, sometimes uh, in sort of long form writing, uh, people end up writing and including um, accidental biases in what they write. Um, this could include, you know, if you're writing a novel and you consistently describe women in a certain way, um, but you don't realize it, then it would be useful to have a sort of NLP system that could, you know, parse what you've written and sort of detect like, you know, hey, this is possibly a social stereotype. You may not be aware of it. Um, so um, just generally been thinking a lot about, you know, how can we take these existing really powerful, you know, language processing systems and make them a little bit more socially aware and socially responsible. Um, so kind of a circuitous route to, um, you know, NLP, but I'm glad I made it here. And I'm glad to you know, talk about things with um, you know, Steve and Rada, who are definitely um, kind of giants in their field. <laughs> well, and you are a rising star, so <laughs> there we are. And it's, I like how you and Steve complement each other with, with your um, interest in terms of multilinguality and um, the diversity of languages and, of course, the social aspects, which are just so central. Um, and both of you have mentioned AI and computational methods, but um, can you just say a little bit more on what are these computational models? What are some of the main achievements we see in this space? Um, especially we hear a lot about neural networks. Um, if you could say a little bit more, what are they, and in particular, how are they used um, in computational linguistics? Whoever between you wants to start. Do you want to start first again? Uh, sure, yeah, I can jump into it. Um, yeah, so I guess um, we can start with, you know, neural networks that they are a sort of commonly used uh, machine learning model nowadays. Um, and they're, um, uh, I feel, I don't have like all the theory behind it, but um, uh, basically the idea is that, um, uh, you're trying to train a, you know, computer to recognize um, like words in a sequence. Um, and the underlying theory of some of these models is that words that co-occur together in a sequence tend to have the same meaning. Um, so um, you're ultimately training this sort of network model to try to predict the next word in a sequence uh, based on um, sort of, a, you know, co-occurrence patterns that it's observed in uh, previous utterances. Um, uh, so this could be, um, you know, one example of a model like this is, um, uh, you know, you give it data in the form of sort of like sentence contexts, like the blank ate the apple, and then the model is trying to predict a word to fill in the gap. Um, so in this case, you know, it probably would fill in the gap with, you know, an, an animal or a person, um, since hopefully it's learned, you know, through training that that is the kind of, you know, entity that tends to eat apples. Um, so um, at a high level, a neural network is uh, really trying to, um, you know, replicate language in terms of uh, uh, predicting words often in the sequence. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know if um, Steve or Roddy, you wanted to add anything to that sort of basic, like what a neural network is, but that's kind yeah. of how I usually explain it. <laughs> no, I think that's great. That's, I mean, that is, that's, it, the task that they're trying to solve is a very simple task in a sense, but it's very hard in another sense. So it's, a, it's really just predicting what words are based on the other words that you've seen. But 
you're, that's actually a very difficult task to perform if you ever try to do it yourself. Um, and, and the hope is to get the network to learn something deeper about language by forcing it to do this hard task. Um, and so, I mean, net networks actually are really old. They're, they're really big these days because of co some commercial successes. They, oh, since about 2012, I think, or thereabouts, 2010 perhaps, um, method or, or systems using neural networks started really not, uh, pushing performance a lot higher than it had been before on, on various tasks. Um, and now it's just everywhere, you know, think of Siri and Alexa and all these uh, spoken systems that you can just talk to that, that, you know, when I started in that seemed like science fiction, I would never see that in my lifetime. Um, there's sort of a threshold of performance that was necessary to take something from being a research system that's interesting to other researchers and turning it into something that's actually usable by people. Um, and neural nets pushed us over that edge for, pushed us over that threshold for um, speech recognition and machine translation and, and data mining, um, extracting information out of text. Um, and sort of putting all those together, or, or you also have things like you have these spoken language chatbots um, like Siri or Alexa. Um, and that's that's why you know everybody is just completely obsessed with neural nets these days. Um, but they're actually quite old. They they came out of um, what we understood about neurons back in the 1940s and 1950s. The original the the basic algorithm comes from back then, and um, there was slow progress made. There was a breakthrough in the 1980s with a method to train the systems. Um, so the, the 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 systems, like the task that that Ian described, the systems themselves are really simple. That, that is, they're made up of units that are really, really simple. You just have their, their models, they're just these cartoon models of neurons where you have synapses feeding into the neuron and each synapse has a weight and you just take the weighted average and that's your activation, but then activation can only go up to maximum one or down to minimum zero. It, it can't go beyond that range. And so it, it gets squashed at the ends. So you, you, you compute the weighted average and then figure out where you are in the range between zero and one. And that's it. That's, 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 a, that's a neural unit. Um, and you just put a lot of them together. Um, so they're big and um, made of a whole lot of simple units of the same sort. I mean, you can put some structure on them, and that's actually quite important. But um, but that's the basic picture. And then the, the the technique for training them is sort of like now you've got a whole bunch of these neural nets, and what you've got are all the weights on the inputs, and you need to tune those weights. And so it's like the, a picture of an old device that has a you know a bank of dials in front, and it's got a needle that you can that is somehow there's something really complicated going on inside of it and you can tune you can turn the dials to try to get the needle to center um, but it's complicated because when you tune a dial at first it might have a big effect and then no effect or it might go start going back the other direction and what a dial does depends on how the all the other dials are set so it's really hard to tune it um, and the breakthrough is to figure out how to basically take just take a derivative to figure out if you take a really, really small adjustment to each of the dials, which direction should you turn them? To make a really small step towards centering that needle. And then you just do that over and over and over again. So what made the breakthrough um, 
there were a number of techniques that people had developed to try to train deeper neural nets that is with lots of layers of neurons um and people had come up with really fancy techniques to try to train these systems but what it really just came down to was having enough data and uh and I, and we mean really amazingly large amounts of data you know the, the orders of magnitude larger than we'd had up until you know the early about, about 2010 or so and it turned out that those techniques for you know fancy training methods weren't necessary and people stopped using them and it's back to the old simple uh, dial tuning method so it's very brute force but there's something going on in all these zillions of numbers and nobody really understands what's going on or how they're representing knowledge so we're trying to force them to represent knowledge but we don't really understand how they do it we just know that they're, they're they work amazingly well on a, a lot of tasks you mentioned having enough data i would add it's also having enough compute like having much that more goes, powerful computers than we used to have which enables yeah that goes hand in hand there's a lot of and that there's a lot of specialized hardware for neural net computing right right and that's that's i think another advancement that made this possible which wasn't possible in the 40s and 50s um, but then since then as you pointed out people have been thinking of this as sort of analogous to the brain using neurons and synapses and all those connections and lots and lots of them. Presumably we have lots and lots of neurons. Um, so when we think of these algorithms and all the claims that we hear out there, um, are these algorithms really succeeding in being like the neural networks being indeed brain-like? Um, and we often hear also about this huge superhuman performance for various tasks. Uh, what does that even mean and are we really there in having brain-like representations and superhuman performance? Yeah, and do you want to comment on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can, um, yeah, just sort of explain how we like understand what these language models learn. Um, so the simplest way is just, um, you know, can we measure how often this sort of prediction task of like filling in the blank, how often that like gets the correct answer? Um, that is a very crude way of measuring, you know, how good the model is. Um, but it obviously isn't like what humans do for language. Like we're never in a case where like, you know, we have some random string of words and we have to fill in the blank. It's a little bit artificial. Um, so to test out how you know much knowledge these language models have actually gained through their learning, um, the people have developed a lot of different tasks for um, uh, to sort of benchmark them against. Um, one example task is question answering. So you provide the model with some long document, and then you give it some question about some information that's in the document, um, and the model has to you know decide which of several possible answers is the correct answer to that question. Um, uh, there's also more um, sort of complicated tasks like um, what's called inference, um, where you have two sentences. One of them is some hypothesis sentence, um, and the other sentence is sort of um, something that may or may not be true based on that hypothesis, and the model has to determine, you know, is this true or false? Um, so people have come up with sort of these um, very, you know, sort of simple to implement, but um, very easy to get data for tasks. Um, and that seems to be generally how we in the field like measure how like good a model is, is whether it can sort of do these kinds of, um, you know, simplified uh, thinking tasks eff effectively. Um, and um, I think that's probably where the sort of word superhuman gets thrown around, <laughs> um, is um, not necessarily that the model is truly like, you know, an AI from a movie, um, but it's more that it is doing extremely well at one of these tasks to the point where it's doing better than the humans who originally created that particular like data set for that particular task. Um, so um, I think that's a good thing to sort of cover is like what we mean by sort of like how you know smart these models are is usually it's based on these sort of not just like toy tasks these are very difficult but these sort of very narrow tasks that um, you know, measure sort of small slices of, you know, what we expect out of regular language. Um, 
So that's what my sort of first reaction to that question is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and to the, you also asked about, you know, how brain like they are or whether they're like the brain, they're originally modeled by the brain. And I think it's yes and no. I mean, I think there there, there definitely are ways that they're brain like. So I mean, they 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 are inspired by neurons, um, and you can re really contrast them with the earlier technology um, that uh, sort of just sort of logic and programming things by hand. So think of that, lump that all together as as um, you know, the contrast to neural nets, um, they sort of had complementary strengths. And one of the things that people are really good at that was very difficult for earlier systems, that earlier systems really struggled with was soft matching, soft pattern matching. People are really good at detecting patterns and that's impossible to program. And, um, um, and nothing that logic gives you any insight into, or not very much insight into. And, and another thing that's sort of related to that is semantic associations, uh, associating um, knowing one thing, but bringing along a lot of associations with it. And both of those are things that neural nets are really good at modeling. And so I, I think they do give us some kind of insight into how people are able to have these skills that, 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 uh, you know, a classic computer does not have. Um, but the the no part of the yes and no is, um, I think the the biggest thing is the brute forceness of them and the data hungriness of them. So one example of that is there's a one of these these models, you know, predict the next element models that are, that's built for speech where you actually you're feeding in just a, an audio signal or someone speaking and train it on that to try to uncover some structure in in speech to, to have a representation of speech and um, the model works quite well but it was trained on 60,000 hours of transcribed speech speech with with text transcription of what was being said, that's just a, a mind-boggling amount of data. Um, the the people have looked at how much speech children are exposed to, and um, apparently there's a big range depending on the household. But right around the middle of that range, if you by the time a child is seven or eight years old, they're speaking, they, they understand the, the, the phonology, the, the sounds of their language perfectly well, just like an adult, even if they haven't mastered all the meanings and everything else about the language, they certainly understand the sounds. Um, but by that point, an average child has been exposed to maybe 6,000 hours of speech, which is you know the 10th of what one of these systems needs. So they're very inefficient with their data. Um, so that's one significant difference. And sort of going along with that is that when they make errors, they make errors that a person would never make. Um, so one of the classic kinds of things is you can train up an image classifier, look at an image and tell you what's in, what it's an image of, but it's possible to go in and tweak a few pixels so that a person wouldn't notice the difference at all and trick the machine into into trick the neural net into saying with great confidence this is not a cat it's an elephant even if, even though it's a cat obviously um, so when they when they make mistakes they make big mistakes and very unnatural mistakes so that's a way in which they're not so much like people um, and I think the other thing is that logic itself is uh, you know that's been developed over. 400 years of effort as a model of high level human thought, human reasoning. And neural nets do not do logic. Um, there are efforts to try to bridge that gap. And, but they, right, the, the basic neural nets don't do logic. They only do pattern matching. 
and, and some kind of representation. And I think generally, just to add to, I, I agree with what both of you have said. Um, it's not necessarily that things that are easy for humans are easy for computers and the other way around. Uh, what's hard for humans is not necessarily hard for computers. So in a way, my view is that computers and humans complement each other as opposed to being analogous to each other. And that sometimes it's maybe a more productive view. Um, and I really like, Steve, what you said, the analogy with how children learn. I, we are not really immersed in thousands and thousands of hours of data in order to, to learn things. So that's, um, that's also something that I, I like generally thinking about. And a lot of times, and both of you have mentioned that um, communication and how obviously we use language to communicate with one another. Now with all these um, AI systems emerging, um, there is communication between the AI systems and humans. Um, again, the examples we've given before with Alexa and Siri and Google Now and all those. Um, so what do you think about how humans and machines will eventually adapt to each other? Like when we talk to one another, sometimes unknowingly we do adjust to each other in terms of style and what we talk about. Um, how will humans and machines adapt to each other? Steve, do you want to go first? I feel like I've been going sure. through that. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, I, I mean, people will definitely adapt, are always adapting to new technology. Um, and um, I, I think the biggest, or for, for me, one of the bigger issues is, particularly at first with these systems, it's really easy to anthropologize anthropomorphize them. It's really easy to think that they're thinking when they're not. Um, and um, so even with the earliest natural language processing systems, there's there's a, a famous system called ELISA that was just was just a bunch of handwritten rules. We see this word respond this way, you see that word respond that way. And people would really get engaged and involved with this system and talk to it and bear their hearts to it, even though it was, it, there, was no, there was no sentience there at all. There wasn't anything behind the scene, behind the screen. Um, um, that's easy to do. And um, as we spend more time with the technology, you, understand it better and you get more effective at interacting with it. It demystifies it. And I think we're sort of, as a, as a society at that stage of, we're still demystifying these, these new technologies um, and, and figuring out how to use them best. You know, both system designers and consumers are, are figuring out how to use them best. Um, and that'll be, you know, the next generation will have, it'll be second nature and it'll be something else that they worry about. I sometimes worry, uh, well, not necessarily worry, but think about how interacting a lot with systems that have limitations are limiting ourselves too. And I mean, part of me, a lot of me is really glad that we are not considering automatic detection of thinking, because I could see how that would limit our own thinking, right? So if these machines would only understand certain things, then I would start thinking in ways that would be understandable, as opposed to sort of the kind of free thought that I have now. Um, and I know, yeah, and you gave the example with, um, like in our previous conversations with the keyword search, like as we try to force ourselves to thinking keywords because that's how some certain systems understand us. Um, so is that something that you foresee as a possible challenge or will you just adjust the way we say adjust from a child when they are growing, we adjust our language in how we interact with them? 
Yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be more of like an accommodation type thing as opposed to purely like this is changing the way that we think um, situation. That's what I hope. Um, certainly, um, yeah, I can, I was going to bring up uh, sort of the point about accommodation actually with, um, I think there are various cases of people adjusting how they talk to like get their Alexa, their Siri, like understand them. Um, so that's um, not a new thing. That's, you know, just one very simple example of, you know, sort of code switching. Um, if you, you know, speak with a non-standard accent, you have to, you know, switch the standard one in order to, you know, be heard or to get people to, you know, treat you seriously in some cases, which is unfortunate. Um, so I, I would foresee that, you know, best case scenario that people sort of adapt to, you know, sort of spoken systems at least as just another sort of thing to accommodate to. Um, and in an ideal world, these systems would adapt to, you know, different accents or different speech styles fluidly. Um, but I think there's going to be some limitations on them that sort of prevent some of that um, from being possible, which I think is kind of a bummer. Um, but um, what was I going to say else? Um, yeah, I think um, you brought up a good point with uh, keyword searches too, how that's, you know, if you end up like, you know, if that becomes sort of your way to think, that can be extremely limiting. <laughs> um, I think it's, that's probably something that teachers have to deal with now is, you know, sort of helping students to, you know, do research in a way that's not sort of, you know, limiting their putting on blinders, like sort of, you know, not just you know, when you think about like how you do research for a school project, it shouldn't just be like in terms of like what keyword search is going to help Google get you the answer fastest, um, but sort of, you know, um, hopefully like, you know, doing that kind of keyword searching won't limit the way that like students think. Um, hopefully that just becomes another tool they have to learn how to use rather than like the only way that they learn how to, you know, think and write out research queries. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, not really well formed thought, but that was, um, I've been thinking a little bit about that too, of like, you know, how much do things like Google or like, you know, search engines shape the way that we end up, you know, trying to gather more information. And um, I think it's something that we have to be actually aware of. I don't think we can just sort of let it go on the back burner. Right, and I think we'll just see as technology advances, we'll see more of this adaptation, like how we adapt to other things. I mean, there are always sort of quote unquote surprises, and we've seen some of those too, even unfortunate surprises with some chatbots really derailed and using a lot of hate speech, and how I don't know, people have almost adapted to that, and what were the things that, um, like, what kind of interactions happened there. So, I have just one more question that I wanted to ask before we move on to questions from the audience, and I see they are coming already both on YouTube and um, on the webinar. So um, while I ask my final question, I'd like to encourage you to ask any questions you have, again, either on YouTube and they will be conveyed to us here or directly in the, using the Q&A button at the bottom of the, of the screen if you are on Zoom. Um, so my final question, I wanted to hear your thoughts about any ethical concerns associated with development and deployment of such um, AI tools that have to do with language um, and if there are any ways in which we could counteract this, these concerns. Steve, did you want to go there's, first? Sure, there's, I mean, I think with any, as with any powerful technology, there's, it's a two-edged sword. And so there are always, there's always harm that can be done. And, um, um, and, and so there's always, there are always significant ethical concerns. Um, it, it used to seem to me that language was, uh, was, was, was mostly harmless, um, as, as Douglas Adams says that um, that there weren't serious technological issues, but well, well actually the one example that I find striking is the in the standard textbook for natural language processing, there's the very first chapter opens with this quote, which it then takes apart and discusses. It's a quote from a movie. It's a quote from 2001, a space odyssey. And it's 
um, the one character saying, open the pod bay doors, Hal, and, and then Hal responds, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. And then they take that apart and discuss what all has to go into natural language processing in order to process that little snippet of conversation or produce that little snippet of conversation. And, but if you think about the background, if you think about what that scene is depicting, it's terrifying because that's the scene where Hal is trying to kill the last member of the human crew. Um, is this what we're trying to build? So, I mean, I think killer robots are probably not the most immediate concern, but, but anytime you have technology that, that can process um, language the way humans can, it becomes a lot more difficult to distinguish it from humans. It becomes a lot more easy, a lot easier to automate things that right now humans, only humans can do. So there's a lot of harm that can be done. I mean, from from putting people out of jobs to to surveillance, um, um, to um, uh, deceptive practices. Um, uh, there, there are lots of lots of these examples you can think of. Um, and there are other things that are that are not even intentionally bad, but just sort of come out of laziness or or just just pressures of doing normal business where you try to do things as cheaply as you can. Then there's a temptation to use this technology without really understanding it and without having experts in the company that really understand it. And um, so one example um, is there's an example that Richard Caruana gives of research that he did where he was looking at um, at um, survival. There, the, the, the idea was to look at a patient presenting with symptoms of a heart attack and decide how to respond. That is, admit them to the hospital, admit them to the ICU, give them an aspirin and send them home. Um, and uh, so they built a model to try to predict risk, to try to predict the odds of that person dying. And the model that worked the best was the neural net. And the, um, the doctors asked, so should we deploy this? And he said, absolutely not. Um, this is a black box. We don't understand what's going on. And there's this other model that I also trained that works almost as well but is does explain itself. It is explainable. It is transparent, not not a back black box. And it's saying things like, if a patient has asthma, the risk goes down. And that's just crazy. That doesn't make any sense at all. And then when he dug into the data, it turns out that was in the data. And the reason that was in the data is that if a patient presents with asthma, the data was historical data. And so if a patient presents with heart attack symptoms and has asthma, they're immediately admitted to the, given the highest level of care. And so they have a lower risk of dying. And that's what the system was trying to predict was the risk of dying. Um, so it wasn't getting the causal structure, but it also couldn't explain itself. Um, so the, the ethical issues are dealing with these risks in a responsible way. I mean, it's very general, a very general thing. But there's, there's also things like, I mean, I, I'll, 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 let, I'll turn it over to Ian, but, um, you know, things that have, have had been discussed a lot with bias. I mean, Ian, you started to talk about uh, as work that you've done. And actually, Ian, as you, as you address this question around ethical concerns, I would merge in a question that came from the audience about whether we can have bias-free language systems uh, when the data itself is filled with bias. That's a great question, a good transition, Steve, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess um, just to make that clear for people who don't think about bias a lot, um, one example of uh, linguistic bias that often emerges as a result of your sort of training data problem um, is that um, stereotypes can emerge 
um, not out of malice, but just because that's what is contained in the data. Um, one commonly cited example is um, that uh, a lot of times in, uh, especially in like newspaper texts, um, uh, nurses will be written about um, as female, um, not because every nurse is female, but just statistically because a higher percentage of people who are nurses identify as female. Um, so in the course of training your um, language model, it will learn to um, use she, her pronouns when talking about nurses. Um, and so that's a one very simple form of bias. Um, and obviously the opposite applies for um, male related things too. Um, I think like male engineer is a common example there. So um, yeah, to answer the question, which was um, about um, if it's possible to get rid of bias, if it's intrinsic in the data, was that roughly what they were asking? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, it is possible. Um, there are many methods that have been proposed to do this kind of like bias mitigation. Um, one of them is to, um, when you're training your model, to have it trained not just to predict things accurately, but also to avoid uh, replicating these biases. Um, so this could be things like, you know, forcing your model to um, avoid associating gender with particular words that are known to have sort of stereotypes attached to them. Um, so uh, you would sort of reward your model if, um, you know, it did not tend to, you know, assign over and over the gender she, her to a word like nurse. Um, and this would, you know, hopefully in the course of training, um, you know, force it to avoid uh, gendering particular words. Um, so the answer to that is um, you have to, or you don't have to, but a lot of approaches have been to um, change the way that the models are trained in order to explicitly reduce this kind of bias. Um, so that's um, one perspective on that that is uh, useful to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks to both of you, um, and um, I'll pass on another question, actually two questions, one coming from the YouTube channel, the other uh, from here from the webinar, ask about the same thing, um, which nowadays I guess it's also the, the elephant in the room when it comes to the systems, Google's Lambda, and the claim that came from somebody that it would be sentient. Um, so what is, what is your view on that? Is, is that really the case? Um, and I mean, we could also talk about what does it even mean for something to be sentient, um, but um, is that even possible with, with the kind of systems we have now? I, I, I would say absolutely not, that, that this, these systems, um, we, I mean, it, it, the reason I'm even hesitating is you're right. We we don't really understand what sentience is, but I think the and I think I don't see any any reason why systems there shouldn't be sentient systems at some point, but these systems are not it. Um, uh, like I was saying, these are I, I think it's a fair way to think about them. I mean, it's a it is an oversimplification, certainly, but th these are really good pattern matchers. Um, neural networks are um, general function approximators, universal function approximators. Any function you give from your inputs to your output, it can learn it to an arbitrary degree of accuracy. A neural net can. Now, what? So that sound that's that is great. Um, but it comes with a price, and the price is that the way it does that um, is more like, you know, imagine a function that's just what you have are linear functions, but the way you're to have general, the way you're achieving generality is by presenting the system with a, with a digital image of the graph of the function, and it's trying to learn the graph of the function by looking at what happens at various points. Um, and what it learns is that picture. It doesn't learn what's going on behind the scenes. But if it has enough data, it can fill in enough of the picture to get a very good approximation to the function that it's trying to predict. But it absolutely doesn't understand what's going on behind what's generating that picture. It doesn't, it doesn't reason. It doesn't 
it, what's missing is this higher level reasoning that, that, that you know, logic is all about, that logic was in, developed to, to account for. Um, and I think we will have systems that combine logical reasoning with neural nets. And there are attempts in that direction. There are attempts to build um, systems that do reason, do genuine reasoning. Um, um, that are either built out of neural nets or or synthesized with neural nets, and um, and those are going to be very interesting looking forward. Uh, but but the current systems are not sentient at all. They're just they're just big blocks of silicon. I mean they're they're they they're, they're very brute force methods. And did you want to add anything? No, I think that's really well put. And um, the only thing I would add is that, you know, there's, I think we mentioned at various points, but there's sort of, you know, building blocks of what we consider to be like cognition. Um, there's things like, you know, memory and like learning and even like metacognition. And um, yeah, if you're, if you're going to like approach sentience, you should really start thinking about if these models can sort of generally approach those general ideas, of like what cognition even is. And um, yeah, neural networks are very long way from, you know, touching any of those building blocks, in my opinion. Yeah. An example that I really like from a very recent publication from University of Washington, uh, where they consider the use of these models for giving advice, like situations that people come up with. Um, and we see that all the time, for instance, on Reddit or other platforms. Um, and when they were faced with such novel situations because these people were going there for new situations. The, the system was completely failing. So it was doing really poorly the same level as a system from 50 years ago, like when the information retrieval really started. It was about the same level and both of them were, were having really low performance. And I think that's a more realistic task um, as opposed to sort of the pattern matching that we generally see. Um, so. There, there are certain tasks that we do which we don't generally use to test these systems because maybe we know they will fail, so we never talk about them. Uh, but there are many such settings where um, current systems would, would really fail. And so that would be, in a way, almost demonstrating this, this point. Um, and if I could add a, an example, um, the, one of the things that really impressed me about neural nets that is um, the game Go, which which it's really a much more difficult game than chess, a much more difficult game to program, and that's another thing where I never thought I'd see the day that that there's a really good computer Go program. But um, but AlphaGo defeated Lee Sedol, who is the the leading player in the world at Go, um, which is um, it really is impressive, um, but there's also a very interesting thing that happened in, in the fourth game. So the fourth game, I think, if I'm remembering right, the fourth game is the one that he, Lisa Dole won. He won one of the games. And that was a game where he managed to complicate matters enough to get the system into a regime that it hadn't seen in its training data. It had basically been trained on every Go game that had ever been reported uh, electronically. Um, and, but, but Lisa Dole got the, got the position complicated enough that the system didn't recognize it. And then the system just played like a novice and completely fell apart. And so that, I think that illustrates both the strengths and the weaknesses of these systems. Right, right. Um, but then to play a little bit on, well, I don't know if it's playing on the strength. There is a question which is for you, Steve, um, since you mentioned all these languages that are dying um, and then building AI technologies which are driven by, by data. Uh, some languages benefit from lots of data, like English has thousands of hours of speech, for instance, whereas other languages have much fewer data. So the question is, whether we could use something like transfer learning to move from 
what we have for one language to um, creating resources or benefiting um, other languages that do not have those resources. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very active area of, of, of research right now. Um, uh, and there's 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 exciting things going on there. Um, there, one one particular piece of technology that that I'm excited about is um, there. There's a number of speech systems that have been developed for multilingual settings, um, and one in particular I've worked with is. Um, uh, an acoustic model, that is, it's a model that's trying to just predict the phone, the individual phones of the language, the sounds, the speech sounds. And there's a, there's a universal inventory of speech sounds called the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. And that's what this system is producing. It's taking raw speech signal and producing IPA symbols as output. Um, and that is valid for any language at all. And so there's a there's a universal system that's that has been built. It, it, it's not enough to make a speech recognizer yet. You need more than just this just the phones, but it's a step in that direction. And um, and I and, and I think that's where a lot of the the for the area of endangered languages. That's where a lot of the strength comes. Is that we can build systems that are that span across languages. They're not just for single languages, and that they start to represent information about language in general, which is is really exciting. Yeah, and then I think there is a lot of uh, potential impact that will come from that, um, given what you mentioned, the, the pace of languages dying, which to me is very sad. Um, Another question, and I'll ask um, you again um, on the concerns that exist around uh, voice. Um, are there any privacy concerns? Uh, for instance, thinking of Amazon Alexa, using the voice of deceased people, um, or for that matter, that's my own addition, even like recording our own voice when we interact. So what are some of the privacy concerns around that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the main privacy concern there is, you know, related to consent. Um, and I think that's going to be something that we see a lot more of in the future is just generally, you know, whatever data you produce, there should be some right to consent to it being used. Um, you know, with someone who died, they cannot give consent. Um, so unless they, you know, had a will or something. Um, and I think that um, has also come up with um, people trying to get voices from celebrities, um, which to me is very creepy, but people have lots of weird ideas. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's sort of the general issue there is just um, whether we have the right to the data that we produce that is ultimately used to train some of these ML models. Um, I think it's yes. Um, I think there's a you know good legal argument to be made in that direction too. Um, I think one, so that sort of, um, that question was more about like generating, um, uh, I guess like, you know, voices, but I think a more uh, prevalent one is, um, is um, whether, you know, uh, the, like what you write on the internet, for example, gets, you know, learned and sort of ends up being replicated in some chatbot somewhere. Um, there's real concern and there's been cases where those, you know, bots that sort of read the internet and then try to speak using what they've read on the internet they end up producing private data. Um, so they'll say, you know, my name is Ian Stewart, my address is 123, whatever. Um, and uh, that was entirely preventable, <laughs> but the system designers didn't think to, you know, change their data when they're training their system to avoid copying that private information. Um, so I think um, another big concern is, you know, how do we first figure out if these models have accidentally memorized some of this private data um, and secondly, how do we, is there any way to sort of like surgically remove it from the model such that the model is still useful, but it's not going to accidentally, you know, reveal someone's location or reveal private information on somebody. Um, so yeah, I think privacy is a huge concern with um, language models, um, especially in terms of accidentally memorizing things that it shouldn't um, or using data that people do not give consent to be used. 
Right, and I think this also brings another question that we had about Copilot on GitHub, uh, where there have been some privacy incidents uh, because of memorizing too much, uh, sharing credit card information uh, with people who are not supposed to see that information. So that's um, that's something that um, I agree with you. It should be a um, front and center in what what's being built alongside with other aspects like bias and so forth. Um, so with that, we are at the end of the hour. Um, we are grateful for everyone who is here and ask uh, very insightful questions. Um, I want to thank um, Steve and Nian for participating and for sharing their uh, their thoughts. Um, I also wanted to thank the Ann Arbor District Library for being our host um, and Aura Bunescu for always being here and helping us from um, behind the scenes. And with that, um, have a great weekend and happy 4th of July. Bye-bye.